and uh, to the debaters, uh, try, please try not to move the microphone and definitely do not tinker with the switch because people may not uh, be able to, to hear you. Um, this debate, uh, ladies and gentlemen, will take place in the Karl Popper format. That means that there will be two teams, uh, both of which will consist of three members. One team will affirm the motion, the other one uh, will disagree with this motion. Uh, every speaker uh, of each team will deliver one speech in alternate order. The first speakers will speak for six minutes, second and third speakers of both teams will speak for five minutes. Uh, first and second speeches will be followed by a three minute cross examination of the speaker who just spoke by a member of the opposing team. As I mentioned, there will be preparation time, eight minutes in total, available for each of the teams, uh, which they are free to use at their, uh, at their own disposal. This debate is the final round of the Karl Popper Debate Championship uh, that has been taking uh, place in the last uh, few days. This year, uh, we have had 52 teams participating, uh, 109 judges represent with individuals representing a total of 50 countries, which we believe is the largest event so far. We have had six uh, preliminary rounds in which these 52 teams competed, and after these, teams, uh, these rounds, the 16 most successful teams advanced into octofinals, and then quarterfinals, semifinals, and now the two teams that won semifinals uh, will compete for the title of champion of the 2011 uh, Karl Popper Debate Championship. The team that will be affirming the motion is uh, called Team USA, but it actually comes from the Hunter College High School uh, from New York. Uh, speaking first for this team will be Brad Wasty. <laughs> speaking second, Diana Lee. Finally, Fiona Lorenzstein. <laughs> the negative side of this debate uh, will be represented by team of, of number one of the Academy of Higher Learning from California. First speaker, David Yu. <laughs> Second speaker, Yena O. Oh. Third speaker, Brian Chan. <laughs> Who won this debate will be decided by seven independent judges. Uh, the chair of the panel, which means that the person uh, in charge of moderating the debate itself, uh, will be Manos Moskopoulos from Greece. And in the panel, he is joined by Southern Thomas from Malaysia, Rose Helen's Hart from the United States, Ronnie Prohor from Australia, Andy Hume from the United Kingdom, Kitso Segadimo from Botswana, and Margot Lord from Estonia. <laughs> I wish good luck to the debaters. I hope everybody will enjoy the debate, and I yield the floor to Manus Moskopoulos. Thank you, Andre. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the judges, one more welcome to the final of the 2011 KPDC. Without further ado, we would like to invite the first speaker from the affirmative side, Gav, to open the debate for us. for talking or using the bathroom for more than two minutes. 
Total migrants have risen from an estimated 150 million in 2000, uh, in 2000 to 214 million persons today. We need a solution for the problem now, especially for those migrants who cannot attain citizenship. In the UK, almost 30,000 applicants for British citizenship were rejected in 2008. The convention protects life, liberty, property, due process, employment rights, education access, and economic rights of all migrants. It further ensures freedom of movement and political rights of documented migrants. <coughs> Migrant Right International describes the convention as, quote, by far the most comprehensive international tool prompting the human rights of migrants, end quote. Our first argument is that ratifying the convention will protect the rights of the migrants. Currently, workers don't enjoy the rights outlined in the convention. The Center for Economic Policy Research found in 2009 that in Germany, immigrants had a 20% less pay than natives who performed the same job. However, migrants help the host country in two ways and deserve rights. First, migrants boost the host country's economy and GDP. Providing them socioeconomic rights gives them the recognition they deserve as well as the tools to further improve society. Migrants are crucial to an economy's success. In the UK, for example, care workers for the elderly are primarily comprised of migrants, who have become increasingly important due to the aging population. Despite these workers' contributions, a COMPS report on the role of migrant care workers in the UK states that, quote, discrimination against migrant workers in relation to working conditions and incidences of verbal abuse emerges as a key issue to be addressed, end quote. The convention ensures that the workplace is a safe place for migrants. No matter how hard a government tries to stop immigration, there will always be people that wish to cross the border in search of newer opportunities. For example, attempts by the United States to curb immigration from Mexico have failed to immediately decrease the number of immigrants coming into the country. Thus, policy should focus on how to regulate immigration so that it benefits all of the parties involved, rather than ignore the problem. Undocumented workers in the United States provide about $1.8 trillion of output and about $650 billion uh, sorry, that was output, $650 billion of output, $1.8 trillion of input. Moving on to our second way in which migrants help their host, the con host countries by providing healthy competition. Without socioeconomic rights and regulation, migrants often end up doing work for much lower wages. In a world where migrants lack these fundamental economic and social rights, they are easily exploited in labor force by natives and work for incredibly low wages that undercut the employment of other natives. However, affirming creates a system of fundamental economic rights that enables workers to join a formal economic system. This formal economic system opens up the job competition, puts everyone on an equal playing field, as it gives these migrants better wages, or the ability to fight for better wages, as well as giving them bargaining power, thus solving the problem of unfair competition. Our second argument is that increased migrants also help the migrants' country of origin. Migrants send sums of money to their home families, also known as remittances. In 2009, there are an estimated $414 billion sent home to migrants' countries of origin from the US alone, a substantial increase even with the current economic climate. Rich countries are the main source of these remittances. Hans Timmer, Director of Development Prospects at the World Bank, explained that, quote, remittances are a vital source of financial support that directly increase the income of migrants' families. Remittances lead to more investments in health, education, and small business, end quote. Similarly, Dali Bratha, a manager at the Migration Unit at the World Bank, says, quote, remittances in 2008 and 2009 became even more of a lifeline to poor countries given the massive decline in private capital flows sparked by the crisis. However, high unemployment is prompting many migrant receiving countries to tighten their quotas, which would probably slow the growth of remittance flows, end quote. Many developing countries have limited opportunities for those with talent and potential and free or migration will enable them to enrich their careers while helping their families as they stake out a living. Ratifying the convention will increase the migrant's ability to move around freely and earn the money to send it back home. Our third and final argument is that the convention provides uh, access to education that is crucial for migrants and their children. For example, undocumented migrant children are denied equal access to higher education in the United States. Under 1996 federal immigration law, states are discouraged from Sorry, states are discouraged from providing work study or financial aid to undocumented migrants. As a result, 5 to 10% of undocumented migrants currently receive any post-secondary schooling. These children face limited job opportunities because they lack college degrees. Other countries, migrants' children have access to education is also severely limited because of a lack of opportunities. Education is a key to further success because it controls the abilities of these children to gain the necessary skills to lift themselves out of poverty. 
A key way to solve the problem of discrepancies in wealth and poverty is to give migrant workers children the tools to help them lift themselves out of these bad conditions. Lastly, we would like to observe that the affirmative need only prove that having all states ratify the convention would be net beneficial. It is not our burden to prove that every single article is perfect. Their criterion for the round is a net benefit analysis of whether having every single country ratify the convention will ultimately help society. Thank you.
for income to try to industrialize, and they don't have the people to try to industrialize it, this is only going to increase more migration from the country away from it. Because once they become dependent, they have no incentive for creating job opportunities for the people in there. We can just rely on this specific uh, source of income. In addition to that, during a severe economic crisis, when migrants receive even less money than they do, sadly, those types of remittances will, will once again disrupt the economic conditions that those countries are heavily dependent on, once again increasing more migration and thus e even increasing undocumented migration. In, a, in addition to that, uh, about remittances, if uh, in some cases since certain people, like in the Philippines, they actually send money back home so that they can actually help those people leave the country and once again spur more migration. And the third point about how the access to education is key and how he mentions all of these net benefits is very important. Uh, that we should try to look towards the amount of benefits we have. And he, he stresses the fact about education. But once again, if we increase illegal immigration by their policy, by basically not giving countries the incentive towards legal migration if we have to pay them more, then this is going to increase the illegal migration. And illegal immigrants, as already conceded in the cross-examination, do not pay more into the system than legal migrants. What this means is that citizens will once again feel very threatened and resentment towards these illegal migrants who are taking, most of the time, public education sources since they don't have enough money to pay for the education system. Once again, causing more social tensions, and once again, causing uh, this type of xenophobic reactions towards migrants that we as, a nation, as nations do not want to, uh, to be basically harboring. So for these reasons and for more, please vote for the negative side. Thank you. Just to make sure that we have enough immigrants coming 
idea? Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, no, sadly, right now, I'm not saying that. In the status quo, even if we're, even if I were to say that it's, uh, sadly, it's not good. The status quo is not good. Your policy is going to make everything ten times worse. Okay, but I'm just so, asking about what we do, and it's because you think well, that we, it's going to be Well, all right. Well, right now, we as a society need to realize that these perceptions of our migrants need to change. But sadly, with the convention, okay. it's just going to worsen this thing up. Uh, do illegal immigrants exist in the status quo? I believe so. Okay. If why can you explain to me then the link as to why there are so many more illegal immigrants coming in if we affirm the resolution? Because countries find less incentive towards paying legal migrants higher to higher wages. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we call the second of the speaker, Diana.
Thank you to our opponents for engaging today's debate with us, and thank you to the judges for adjudicating this round, as well as the audience for watching. Now, when we're answering today's motion, we have to resolve three fundamental questions. The first one is, what exactly is the affirmative burden, and what does the affirmative have to demonstrate in order to win the round? The second question that needs to be answered is, in terms of illegal immigration, is there going to be a significant impact on illegal immigration and the volume of immigrants that pass through nations if you affirm today's resolution? Then, the third and final question is, what benefits do migrants bring, and how can we ensure that they benefit both the host country and the country large? So let's answer the first question. Now, take a look at the motion. The motion asks whether nations should ratify a certain convention. During cross-examination, we asked the opposition, should we have ratified the UDHR? First of all, they don't even really answer the question. They just keep telling you that we did it, which unfortunately doesn't actually answer the question of whether we should have done it. So as the affirmative, we're going to assume that basic human rights are a good thing. They can contest that if they want. So the issue is that even if there's no clear enforcement mechanism, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't ratify something. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't attempt to do something. So even if there's no clear enforcement mechanism, it does not necessarily mean that you negate state resolutions. The second problem with this is that we are still showing some sort of marginal benefit. So they're only casting doubt on whether our plan will work 100% of the time. But as long as we can demonstrate some sort of benefit, that should be sufficient for you to affirm. Lastly, they make arguments about how the government doesn't know where illegal immigrants are, but our argument is that there should be basic rights for these people. Just because an immigrant is illegal doesn't mean they're invisible or you can't see them or they don't exist. It doesn't mean that they don't deserve basic rights. So now let's answer the second question, which is exactly what is going to happen to illegal immigration if we ratify the convention? Go to the negative's first argument. Their first argument is that illegal immigration will increase because then they're going to get higher wages. First of all, this argument isn't unique to the affirmative side or the negative side. In both worlds, there's still going to be illegal immigration. There's always going to be this incentive for people to leave their countries. People don't migrate necessarily because they love the countries they're migrating to, but rather because they're escaping from certain conditions at home. So in both worlds, there's still clearly going to be migration. The second problem is that following the logic of the negative, this means that we should just pay migrants as little as possible so we don't, uh, so we don't have to deal with this flow of migrants. Their argument is that if we actually give them fair wages, if we give them basic rights, if we give them basic fundamental human rights, then they'll want to come to the country. This means that in the negative world, they are defending exactly the problems outlined in the status quo of the affirmative. The fact that people are getting paid less even though they aren't doing any worse work. The fact that they're getting charged to go to the bathroom. The fact that working conditions are absolutely horrible. They don't propose any sort of solution for this. And in fact, they say that this is a good thing that we should keep. If you disagree with that, then you ought to affirm today's motion. Now let's go to the next argument they make, which is that it's going to increase xenophobia. The problem is that they fail to point out a link between affirming the motion and increasing xenophobia. In fact, we are, uh, we are enforcing the norm, we are encouraging the fact that these people should actually deserve rights and that we shouldn't treat them the way that we currently are. So, let, I've already addressed the argument of the enforcement mechanism, so let's go to the last short argument in the negative case, which says that it gives the people incentive to leave. However, our argument in the, ne in the affirmative case is that remittances will actually solve this problem. So let's go to that argument. Their argument is that people will become dependent on remittances, so it's only going to increase migration. First, our argument is that the only way for people to lift themselves out of poverty is to ensure that they have money flowing in from people who migrate abroad. Their world, in their world, what ends up happening is people don't send money back in developing countries. People who are skilled and talented in these developing countries can't leave, and they shouldn't leave. The problem is that in these original developing countries, there aren't enough opportunities for these people to fully utilize their skills. So even if we shut them back in their developing country, they can't use those skills to make money for their families. Remember, the World Bank very clearly explains to you that $414 billion were sent back in remittances. And they clearly explain to you that all this money has gone to promoting rights. If you negate today's resolution, you deny those families in those developing countries the opportunity to lift themselves out of poverty. In fact, this would actually decrease migration because if we allow them to have enough money to start building up themselves in their developing nations, then they won't have such a strong incentive to leave. Lastly, let's answer the third question, which is the benefits of migration. So even if they win the argument that there's going to be increased migration, let's go to the first contention in the affirmative case, which demonstrates why this is a good thing. Remember, we explained to you that uh, these migrants always end up taking jobs that the original citizens won't take. So there's no competition for jobs. They're still paying taxes because they're still migrants. 
So we still accept these migrants because they have clear benefits. For example, in the UK, these caretakers are composed mostly of immigrants. For example, in the US, Mexican immigrants take many jobs that they don't want. In fact, the economists conducted a study in 2010 and found that if 100 million migrants, uh, 100 million more migrants moved, global GDP would increase by 8%, which benefits everybody in the world, both the host nation and the country world. That's how you're doing it. Then we can weigh the benefits and harms. I also 
say it's impossible for you to show some sort of harm, that's why we're debating about it. But if you do manage to win some sort of harm, then we'll just compare benefits and harm. Whoever gets a bigger impact at the end of the year. Thank you so much. I would like to invite the second negative speaker, Yana. Continue to say it's not 
the, the development is not going to happen. Second of all, our opponents continue to say that, there's, that these individuals have terribly low wages, that they can't do anything about it. So if they have terribly low wages, then how is it that these individuals have sent back remittances? How is it that those remittances are helping that country? It's because those wages are better than what's already offered in the, um, the, um, the home nation. And we can see that there are those benefits that come from this as well. Last but, not least, um, last but not least, our opponents said remittances lead to promoting human rights. However, we can see that in Cuba, 20% of remittances go to the hostile government. Hostile governments hurt human rights of citizens. So, because our opponents agree that human rights are essential, we can see that remittances and the issue with these remittances are going to harm these individuals and the, uh, for these citizens. And the, um, um, <laughs> furthermore, furthermore, our opponents stated that both um, that because both worlds have illegal immigration um, and because both worlds have legal immigration, um, basically we're saying that, oh, we want to pay these immigrants as little as possible, we shouldn't give them human rights, and they're living in horrible conditions. We, what we're saying is not that, not that we want to perpetuate status quo, but, be, but by through their resolution, through our opponent's topic, we will be worsening status quo, that we're leading to worse benefits, um, to worse harm. Because you can see that illegal immigration increases for what reason? When they protect these rights, unfortunately, migrants, um, unfortunately, individuals, um, governments do not want to give higher wages to these migrants. We can already see that. Why do governments not want to give them higher wages? Because migrants work for lower wages and it helps the economy of that nation. Now, if we if we do give them more benefits and we do increase their wages, what happens? This means that the countries are less likely to want to give um, to as pe let people enter a country legally. And if they do, and if there's less people entering legally, then what happens? These individuals still want to enter a nation regardless of if, if it's legal or illegal. So then we can see that illegal immigration will increase because they're going to enter a country out of their way. So we can see that pretty much um, that pretty much that's what's going to happen. And last but not least, our opponents stated that if we can prove that there's harm. To, through no enforcement, then, um, then we win that quote. However, we can see that there is harm through no enforcement because first, first and foremost, citizens lose faith in their nation if they see that a country cannot uphold the things that they promise to uphold. And second of all, other countries lose faith in that nation because they believe that they cannot uphold the things that they promise to do. So now both the countries and the citizens delegitimize that the government cannot uphold that, um, uphold that promise. And because of that, we're very pleased to negate the resolution. Thank you. Less legal migration. Because governments less want 
less legal alignments if wages increase. That's okay, the point. Okay, okay. So in other rights, they're the only pull factors that they just want to come to the country, right? Right, they want to come to the country. So, the right? so they don't get any of the rights in which are enumerated in any situation, right? I don't understand. So they're not getting basic human rights, like right to due process, that kind of stuff. Well, but they're not getting any Illegal thing. migrants? The illegal migrants that right. are coming they, into the They can't because there's no enforcement for that. All right. So let's move on to the whole, we can't enforce anything. Okay. Governments can't control illegal migrants. Why can't they control these people? Because they don't know they exist. Right? They don't know. Because they don't know that those individuals okay, are so, there. Okay, so, okay, okay. So all you're saying is that pretty much these these governments are incapable of stopping them and they're just going to keep coming, right? And they can't protect their rights because they don't right, know they right. exist. So you, you last speaker said that you're just defending the status quo, but then you're saying, no, we're not defending the status quo. What exactly are you guys? We're advocating that your class will worsen the situation for all individuals. Okay, so you are defending the status quo. You're saying the status quo is better than our plan. It's right? better, yes. Okay, so we're all, okay, so you're talking about the status quo, and that's that's what exactly you're advocating. No, we're advocating that your plan will worsen the situation. Perfect. Right, right. That's not really an advocacy, that's an negative thing, right? Okay. Okay, cool. That's okay. Now we'd like to invite the third speaker of the affirmative side, Fiona.
So I'm going to talk ex about exactly how this word should functions in the round and what this means for enforcement. Then I'm going to talk about flow and restriction of rights. I'm going to talk about whether or not more illegals are actually coming if you affirm the resolution. I'm going to talk about if less migrants are coming if you affirm the resolution. And I'm going to talk about whether or not either of these things are reason to take away rights or not provide these adequate rights. Then third, I'm going to talk about the, how affirming a resolution helps the country of origin. Basically remittances and a couple of things on this. Last, I'm going to talk about the host country, how it helps the host, to host country. Finally, I'll give you an overview, weighing the costs and benefits of affirming and negating, and tell you why you should affirm. So let's start with the word should, right? So we talked before about how just because you should do something does not necessarily mean you have to prove that it's going to work or you have a way to do it, right? I should do my homework. How am I going to do my homework? That's not really the question. The question is whether or not I should do my homework. So the point that we're showing you that this is a good idea, that countries should ratify this treaty, that's reason to affirm. But secondly, even if you don't agree with this, we ratified the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights because it was the right thing to do. This declaration also had no enforcement mechanism, yet we did it, and I would argue that this declaration has benefited society as a whole. Now let's talk about the fact that we should also attempt to do this, even if there's no clear enforcement mechanism, and I would argue that enforcing this declaration, attempting to do this, is going to have some net benefit, and we'll talk about that later on. Now let's move on to the second main argument. The second main argument is flow of migrants and restriction of rights. Now, they tell you that illegal immigration is going to increase exponentially in the affirmative world. However, they don't provide a clear link between the rights that we give, because remember, we're just giving illegals these basic fundamental human rights. That's only the first half of the convention that pertains to illegals, and the influx of the supposed influx of illegal immigrants, right? The fact is that illegal immigration occurs in both worlds. This brings me to another point about illegal immigrants. They said there's no way to enforce rights with illegal immigrants because they do, we don't know they exist. Well, I myself am pretty aware of the fact that illegal immigrants exist in the United States, and I would say that providing rights, even if we have no clear way for them to be enforced, is the right thing to do. Should we provide them with rights? Absolutely. Secondly, I would say that even if migration slows and we're not allowed to take as many migrants as before because we're paying them these much, much larger salaries, which is what they say we're doing in the affirmative world, this is not a reason to not provide them with basic human rights. As we clarified in cross-examination, do you pay someone one cent an hour, whatever it is, a couple dollars an hour, 20% less than a citizen simply because it's benefiting your country? And now I'm going to tell you why it's not actually benefiting the country and why it would be more beneficial for the country, for the host country's economy to affirm this resolution. So this is our last argument. Our last argument, and we've showed you this with empirical evidence, is that as long as migration, uh, that, that a flow of migration into the country helps the country, the host country. Now we showed you that in the United States, immigrants are significantly contributing to the economy. Secondly, we showed you that it also helps the country of origin, right? This is the remittances argument. First of all, they talk about human capital. Human capital is always going to be leaving these developing countries. That's part of the reason that they're developing countries. Sending back remittances isn't necessarily increasing the number of people who leave. Secondly, the World Bank shows us that um, the World Bank shows us that the, these remittances are not just going back to families to bring them over. They're going back to build infrastructure, hospitals, etc., boosting the economy. So this is helping the developing country, and this was not exactly addressed. Secondly, there's no point to having human capital if there's no money in that developing country. This point was also brought up and essentially dropped in the last speech. If you have human capital, but it's completely stagnant in that country and there's no influx of money, what exactly is this human capital doing? As we've seen, $414 billion in remittances was sent in 2009. If you affirm this resolution, you're helping migrants make more money. Therefore, those migrants are able to get better jobs, they're making more money, they're sending home more remittances and helping the, the country of origin even more. Now. Just to give you a broad overview of this round, the negative tells us that they don't want to perpetuate the status quo because they recognize that there are serious problems within the status quo. However, they also don't provide us with a counter plan. So essentially, the negative is telling you that there are a couple of harms within, our, within affirming. I just showed you that all you get from affirming is benefits. If you dislike the status quo, which the negative says they do, if you believe that it is hurting rights, if you believe that it is hurting people, then you must affirm the resolution because the negative gives us no other choice. Thank you very much. I urge you to affirm the resolution. <laughs> Thank you, and we go on to the last figure for this round, Brian from AXO. Ladies and gentlemen, as a last speaker,
speaker of the entire KPDC tournament, I have only one role in my speech, and that is to weigh the conflicts and see and show you how the negative has clearly shown you that this policy, counterplan or no counterplan, will be harmful in this world. And that's the first thing I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about burdens. The negative has no burden absolutely at all to show you that there's some sort of counter plan we can implement to remedy the status quo, but we only have to show you that if we implement and ratify this convention, then the status quo will be harmed, and that's exactly what I'm going to be showing you in this speech, that the status quo will be harmed. First thing I'm going to talk about, and the most important thing in this debate, is illegal immigration. We have shown you time and time again that this policy will increase illegal immigration. There's two things and two contradictory things that the affirmative has said to this. The first thing that said is, well, illegal immigration happens anyway, so this is non-unique, which is what Fiona said, uh, which is what Diana said in her second speech. I'm going to say that this is completely false because we have shown you that if we implement and ratify this convention, illegal immigration will increase. The logic behind that is very simple. If we increase rights, the government has to pay more money towards the legal immigrants, which de-incentivizes de governments to accept legal migrants. That does not mean legal migrants will back out and say, look, I'm going to stay in my host country. It means that they're still going to find or try to find some way to get into their nation or get into the host nation, which in, in turn creates illegal immigrants. And we've already established throughout this debate, both the affirmative and the negative side, that illegal immigrants are not good. We can't protect them. We can't really, they, they don't benefit the economy as much as legal migrants. And what we want and what we don't want in this resolution is for illegal immigration to increase. Now Fiona brings up a new point here and says that, well, we can still protect illegal immigrants somehow. Let me ask you a question. How do you give due process to an illegal immigrant or give them a lawyer if you have to deport them if you identify them? You can't give a lawyer to someone you identify if you, if you identify them. You have to either send them back or give them amnesty. They have not really provided a way of how we're going to enforce rights if one, we can't identify them, and two, if we identify them, we have to send them back. So we have clearly shown you that one, illegal immigration will increase, and two, that once this increases, there will be a massive violation of the very things that they want to protect, human rights, basic human rights, and that's clearly something that we, neither side wants, and I hope the judges and our, our audience doesn't want either. The second thing I'm going to talk about is the uh, enforcement issue. Now, Fiona comes up here in the third speech and says that they don't need to talk about enforcement because the resolution says should. I'm going to make it very clear. The resolution says that countries should ratify the convention. It does, not, it does not say that countries should follow and enforce the, enforce the convention so it works, but merely that they ratify it. In other words, they sign their name onto the convention. That means that they make the promise to follow it, but as the negative has clearly shown you, it does not mean that they will follow it. Graham in his first speech told you that we have to weigh the net benefits and, harm, the net benefits and harms. If you really want to weigh the net benefits and harms, you have to see if the plan actually works. Because if the plan doesn't work, then there is no net benefit because Quite frankly, as we have shown you, the plan will only not only will not work, but it will actually create more harm. Also, let me mention that they have said nothing against the fact that if we ratify and it doesn't work, then the other governments will lose legitimacy from both their citizens and the other countries around them. This has not been addressed at all by the affirmative side, and we ask you to extend this point. The final thing I'm going to talk about is the developing nations and how this resolution will harm them. Now, the only thing they have said is remittance, 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 with Fiona coming up here in the last speech and saying that human capital is something that is not really necessary because we send money back to build hospitals and infrastructure. We have already mentioned it, David, and I'm going to mention it again. Why would a government build a hospital if there's no one to cure? We're already sending so many migrants there, and if we incentivize more migrants to go, there's no reason to build hospitals and build infrastructure, because one, there is no one there to actually provide the infrastructure for, and two, there really is no one to build it because human capital is being lost. There are, there's a lack of jobs in these developing countries, as stated, and quite frankly, there, this won't be fixed if this, somehow this resolution will increase illegal migration, as we have stated. So, to summarize basically what we have shown is one, that there obviously is more harms than benefits by ratifying this convention. Two, that the affirmative burden is to show that this plan will work and that the negative has clearly provided you reasons why it doesn't. And finally, by ratifying this convention, we're not only harming the migrants, the both illegal and legal, the host country, but most importantly, the loss of human capital and developing nations. And for those reasons, I strongly urge you to vote in favor of the negative. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Andrew Schultz, for moderating the final debate. Now it's time for a short cut break.